Even though I turn it on, I gotta plug the microphone in. I found the pastor. Awesome. He's here. We can start now. Wonderful. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Bible Baptist Church. Love to see all y'all here. So I'm going to stand, turn to page 433. 433. Good song. 288. 288. 288. 288. I am resolved no longer to linger, charmed by the world's delight. Things that are higher, things that are no have allured my sight. I will hasten to Him, hasten so glad and free. Jesus, greatest, highest, I will come to Thee. I am resolved to go to the Savior, leaving my sin and strife. the words of life. I will hasten to Him, hasten so glad and free. Jesus, greatest, highest, I will come to Thee. I am resolved to follow the Savior, faithful and true each day. What he saith, do what he willeth, he is the living way. I will hasten to him, hasten so glad and free. Jesus, greatest, highest, I will come to thee. I am resolved. I think that was it, Sam. I think that was it. We're getting a little too happy over here. Or I'm losing my mind. I don't know. <laughs> oh, fourth verse. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, that one. That one. Yeah, we, we can repeat the course again if y'all want to. We can do it again. Moving on. I like it. 431. 431. Four thirty one. Silent night, holy night. All is calm, all is bright. Round yon virgin, mother and child, holy infant, so tender and mild. Sleep in heavenly 
silent night, holy night, shepherds quake at the sight, glory stream from heaven afar, heavenly hosts sing alleluia, Christ Silent night, holy night, Son of God, love's pure light, radiant beams from thy holy face, with the dawn of redeeming grace, Jesus Silent night, holy night, wondrous star, lend thy light, with the angels let us sing, alleluia to our King, Christ the Savior is born, Christ the Savior is born. Amen. You may be seated. All right. Well, announcements uh, next Saturday which is December 19th, uh, next Saturday at 5 o'clock, we have our Christmas party. And because of the way we're doing the food, if you plan on attending, please sign up. Because the way we're doing the food, the main courses, Betty and Mary Beth are going to be cooking all that. And then, uh, so if you plan on attending, you need, to, you need to sign up. Sign up is in the back in the foyer. And if you want to bring a dessert, uh, sign up is also back there uh, so you can sign up for a dessert and uh, so all the sign up sheets regarding the party and desserts are all back there and then next Sunday uh, is the evangelistic uh, Christmas service with the children's church program and some of y'all saw the children's church practicing this there, there's a bunch of people in here this morning in sanctuary but Children's Church was practicing, and so that was for next, that's for next Sunday, and so next Sunday we have one service at 11 o'clock, so one service at 11 o'clock, and if, if your kids are in the program, please be here by 1030 so they can get all prepared and dressed and all that kind of thing. Michelle asked me to ask you all if, you, if your children are in the program Get them here around 10:30, which should be a stretch. I mean, we usually start at 10 anyway, but 10:30 uh, so that the kids can get dressed and get prepared and all that kind of thing in the fellowship hall. So next Sunday, one service, 11 o'clock. But if you're in, their kids are in the program. Be here a little bit early so they can get get prepared for all that. And I think those are all the announcements. I can't think of anything else. Um, have a couple men come forward and we will take up the offering this morning. Louie, you want to pray? <laughs> Can't get these kids to pray. <laughs> Go ahead, Alan. <laughs> Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for this time this morning. We thank you for Sunday school. What a wonderful message. Mary and Sharon 
everything about Jesus Christ. It's all pointed to Jesus Christ. We thank you for that. Thank you for allowing us to be here this morning. Thank you for every soul that's here. We ask that you bless the offering that go for the spreading of your word. Pray your Holy Spirit touch upon Brian as he brings forth the message today. Be with all the souls that are not here for whatever reason, those that are sick or have problems, be with them, travel and be with those. Be with each one that is here that you would just feed us with the word of God today. Amen. Thank you for salvation in Jesus Christ. And we ask this all in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. this morning. Luke chapter 2. And I'd I like, I really like Christmas season and Thanksgiving and Christmas and all this time between these two holidays. I like this time. I like to preach on things that are about this time. And um, this is this is a sermon that uh, I don't know, we work it over every couple of years, and uh, I just really love the object lesson that the manger provides. And so in Luke chapter 2, the fact that Jesus Christ was born and ended up in a manger shortly thereafter, uh, it's, it's very significant in three different ways. And every time... Every time the word manger shows up in Luke chapter 2, it describes one of those ways that that it's significant. And it's it's just a great object lesson. And so the the subject is the significance of the manger. And if you think you've heard it before, you've heard heard a variation of this before, because I've I've gone over this before. But uh, I I just love the, the picture of the manger and the way... The way it describes and illustrates Jesus Christ and his life and the world's attitude towards him and in who he is and, and all those different things. So Luke chapter 2, <clears throat> verse 7, we'll just, we'll just read the verses here all through, um, I don't know about, uh, we'll just read the ones that contain the word manger in it. Luke chapter 2, verse 7, the Bible says, And she brought forth her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger. Now here's the significance. Because there was no room for them in the inn. That's that's number one. Look in verse verse 12. The angels tell the shepherds, you're going to find, uh, find the Savior, which is Christ the Lord in the city of David. In verse 12, and this shall be a sign unto you, shepherds, you shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. So the first significance is he's in a manger because there's no room for him in the end. Second significance is it's a sign to the shepherds. This, whenever you find the baby, and this myths may have been one of their, one of their stables or something like that, that may be the, the connection here. When you find the, the baby in the manger, that's, that's the Christ. That's the Savior. And then in verse 16, it says, They came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And the significance of that is here is the creator of all things laying in a manger. What, what a... What a, a, an extraordinary set of events, but what great significance this, this illustration and this, this manger has 
in telling the story of Jesus Christ. So let's pray. And I want to talk to you this morning about the significance of the manger. But let's pray. Father, I pray that you would help us this morning. Um, Lord, we, we, we need Jesus Christ to be magnified. We need Jesus Christ to be bigger in our lives. We need to know more about him. We need to... Uh, uh, we need to learn of him. We need to learn how he thinks. We need to apply those things to our lives. We need. We just need help. We need help from you. Um, your light, and without without you, we just wander in darkness. So, Lord, I pray this morning as we go through these verses about Jesus Christ being a baby in a manger and the all, all the significance around that. I pray that, uh, Lord, you'd help us magnify and, and exalt Jesus Christ in a proper place in our lives and th- think about him the way we ought to think about him. And uh, thank you for each soul that's here. For those that are watching, I pray they'd be blessed. For watching, those that are traveling, I pray you'd keep them safe and get them back home safe. Those that are sick, or that you'd give them grace to, to deal with the sickness. And, um, Lord, thank you again for... For everybody here, I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, the word manger. So it it just shows up these three times in Luke chapter 2. It's the only times it shows up. And uh, you know the story. You you know the nativity scene and and all that. And it's probably one of the most... Uh, one of the most common scenes around the world. Um, One of the most common thoughts at this time, the nativity scene... But the significance of that whole, that whole scenario about Jesus Christ ending up in a manger, it, it is extraordinary how it tells the story of who Jesus Christ is and, and several aspects about his life. Um, so we're just going to take the, these verses as they show up, and I'm going to each, at each point describe some things about the Lord Jesus Christ and the significance that this baby, I mean, it would be, it would be a weird situation probably if any, any, any moms in here had a baby and ended up in a barn somewhere with that baby. That would be, that would be a pretty unique set of circumstances. And so what leads to this, it's, it's just extraordinary. I hope you get, get out of it what I've got out of it and I can, I can, transfer that information and encourage you this morning. So the first thing is, the first time the word manger shows up in Luke chapter 2, the Bible says she brought forth her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling clothes, laid him in a manger, and here's the reason, because there was no room for them in the inn. Because there's no room for them in the inn. So they tried to get a room. They, I mean, they worked on it. They tried to get a room, but there's no, no place to go. Um, all the rooms are booked, and so uh, um, I, I, I like in this time of year all the the Christmas music and the lights and the just the the festive feel of everything. But you got to know, you got to know Mary and Joseph, Mary particularly, having a baby, not having a place to go. This is a difficult, this is a very, very troubling time. Very difficult. And then she goes, they they try to find a room and and the innkeeper, maybe there's multiple innkeepers, maybe they try different places. Point is, there's just just no room for Jesus Christ. And uh, I, I think we can probably relate to some of that in our lives. Um... Maybe, maybe you've, you've found in your life that uh, you, you try to squeeze in Jesus Christ, that he's not really the focal point of your life. He's just sort of this person that if I can fit him in, then I'll fit him in. And if I can't fit him in, then I just can't fit him in. He'll just have to, have to wait. So I... I, I Probably a lot of our lives are like, are like the, the, the innkeeper. Um, here's a man, I, I don't know why, why he uh, uh, 
doesn't make room. Obviously, he's already booked the rooms. The people have already, maybe they've, they've already paid their money. I, I don't know, but maybe, maybe there's no room. But I imagine, I imagine if he knew who Jesus Christ was, he would probably make room. Uh, he, he would probably just, just, just figure out how to make this thing work. If he knew that Mary and Joseph were carrying the creator of the world, the savior of all mankind, I imagine the innkeeper would probably just adjust things to make, make this work. But he doesn't know who Jesus Christ is, and so maybe that's something you can relate to. I, I don't know. But maybe there's no room. If, if it's true that it, we, ha- we have a hard time making room for Jesus Christ, it's either true because we don't know who Jesus Christ is, or it's true because we're just not that interested in making room for him when we got kind of our own agenda that we want to make room for. So either one of those things is, is true with the innkeeper. He, he obviously doesn't know who Jesus Christ is. I imagine if he did, he would have made room, but he didn't, so he didn't make room. Maybe, maybe he's got some... Some, some guests that have already paid. Or, or that they, they made their reservations. And I mean, you don't want to, I don't know if you, you've traveled very much, but sometimes you get, it, it's, it's really, it's really uh, frustrating to have reservations get canceled on you, especially when you're in the middle of an airport and a flight gets canceled or something like that. Uh, but if, Reservations that get get canceled are pretty frustrating, and they're probably frustrating or hard for the person who's doing the canceling since they know, you know, this is going to be tough on these people. So the innkeeper probably didn't make room because he already had reservations. And so here, here's, the, here's the thought here. In your life, in my life, we've probably set some things aside and made some reservations that don't include Jesus Christ. So that means if I'm going to include Jesus Christ in my life, I'm going to have to maybe kick out some guests that I've already made reservations with. I'm, I'm going to have to send some people home and say, I, I, you, you, your reservation has been canceled because the Creator of all things and my Savior has a reservation, or I'm going to make him a reservation here. The point is, it's difficult to cancel reservations. This innkeeper probably, he, he's obviously booked up, and just maybe doesn't have the stomach to cancel some reservations. And so, you and I, our lives are pretty booked up, and maybe in our lives, you, you just don't have the stomach to set this thing aside so I can make room for Jesus Christ because I really, I really want this thing in my life and so I'm just going to keep it here because I just don't have the, I don't know, the stomach or the guts or whatever to push this thing out and make room for Jesus Christ. There's, there's no room because the innkeeper, maybe he's, he's ignorant of who Jesus Christ is. Maybe, maybe he's in, uh, 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 it's just inconvenient I mean, if, if think, we talk about this a lot in Sunday school, but this sermon kind of lends itself to that. But if Jesus Christ is going to occupy more of your life, that means other things are going to have to start occupying less of your life. Then whatever it is that's taking up the time and the space is going to have to diminish, and you're going to have to purposely give Jesus Christ place instead of those things. Maybe, maybe the innkeeper, it's just, it's just too inconvenient. Um, th- th- things, rearranging things, rearranging life, rearranging my ideas about life, rearranging my philosophy on life, that's, that's just inconvenient. It, it's, just, it's just maybe asking a little too much. Well, that's the innkeeper. That's the innkeeper. He just... Just it, it, he's ignorant of who Jesus Christ is. He doesn't know who he is. It's it would be inconvenient to kick out some guests and make room. That would be inconvenient. Probably hurt his business. Uh, maybe maybe he's just indifferent. Um, he, he didn't didn't care enough 
and obviously these kind of things go together, but he certainly didn't care enough to make room for Jesus Christ. It, it was just, just indifference. Maybe in your life it, it is a matter of care. I, I say this, it seems like this year particularly, and, and I hate just talking about the year because everyone, it's so, it's so obvious. It's so much that's happened. But it, it has, I think, driven people emotionally, just some people, just into the ground. And for some folks, they, they, just, they, just, they just blow up. It just, I can't take any more of this. For other folks, it's more of like, a, just, uh, I'm done. I'm just done with it. I'm just done with this. I'm done with trying to make things happen. I'm done with trying to uh, uh, whatever. And I, I, I know, I mean, I, I've had those thoughts as a pastor. Where it's like, okay, we have a church. People show up on Sunday. But we can't nursing home. We can't do this. We can't do that. We can't do this. We can't do that. And it's, sometimes you look at the scenery and you're just like, what is the point of this? I mean, you can keep hearing sermons, but if you're not doing sermons, if we're not doing sermons, who cares if we hear them? We just go home and then we'll show up again next week and hear another sermon and all go home and say, that's a good sermon. <laughs> well, just record it and we'll just play it for you every week and you can just say it's a good sermon every week and I'll just stay home. <laughs> you understand? It's, 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 it's been... Maybe it's just indifferent. And this, this, the, the things that have happened have probably driven some people to become just emotionally indifferent towards the things of God. Like, I don't care because I feel like caring just makes me more vulnerable and it just makes things that much more, that much worse. So I'm just not going to care anymore. I mean, I, I know some guys and, in, in ministry, I mean, it, it just, I think everyone's had those thoughts, or at least a lot of people have. Here's the innkeeper. He's indifferent. I mean, here's, here's a, he he's obviously doesn't know who Jesus Christ is. You've got the ignorance thing. You've got the inconvenience. If I, if I kick out some guests, these people are going to be mad. So I just don't want to kick out any guests, and so... Uh, when, when all things are considered, I just don't care enough about making room for Jesus Christ. I just don't care enough about doing that. So here's the statement. She brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, laid him in a manger because there's no room for him in the inn. So here, here's the circumstances that lead up to this problem. you got an innkeeper that is... Either is ignorant of who Jesus Christ is. Maybe that's that's your case this morning. And I, and I hope if it is, you, you can learn about Jesus Christ and say, you know what? Including Jesus Christ in my decisions, in my life, in my in my uh, um, uh, uh, behavior, that that would be the best thing that could happen to me if I could just I would just include him instead of excluding him from from, from my life. It's significant. Number one. It's significant why Jesus Christ is even in a manger to begin with. Why is he even there? Well, he's there because there's just no room for him. And there's not no room for him because there's no room for him. There's no room for him because nobody wants to make room for him. There is room, just not room for him. There's, there's room, just not for him there's not room. Uh, you, I mean, we could talk about the, the way the world treats Jesus Christ, but you know how the world treats Jesus Christ. I mean, it's, that's not a surprise. There is no room for Jesus Christ in, in the world's education. There's no room for Jesus Christ in the world's business. There's no room for Jesus Christ in the world's uh, morality. Or There's no room for Jesus Christ in the world's standards. There's no room for Jesus Christ in any of that. But you know that. What about Christians who sit in church, though? Is, is there room for Jesus Christ? 
Or, or have we just, we just, you know, it just, it's, it's, it's uh, we're like the innkeeper, just, you know, I'll, uh, I don't have any place for you, but I'll, I'll put you out in the barn, and if I, if I need to get a hold of you, I'll just come get you from the barn. That's kind of how a lot of times we think we treat Jesus Christ. First of all, number one, it's significant why Jesus Christ is even in a manger to begin with. That's, a, that's an extraordinary, very unique situation. So you've got to ask why. Well, here, here's the reason. There's just there's no room for them in the inn. There could be, but there's just no room for Jesus Christ in the inn. Second thing is, the shepherds. This is, this is a little more, more upbeat here. <laughs> now he's in a manger, and somebody owns this manger, I mean, it's not, doesn't belong to Joseph and Mary. So when they have, when Mary has the baby, has Jesus, they're outside, got to find some shelter. They end up in a barn somewhere, I guess. And ultimately, in a, in a, <laughs> Jesus Christ ends up in this manger. And I mean, you, you know what a manger is. I mean, you can go, you can go buy a manger over at Tractor Supply. <laughs> you know what a manger, it's just, it's just a feed trough. And so, somebody owns this barn, somebody owns this, and I imagine these shepherds that the angels talk to, they're probably, they, they're the owners of this. And so, uh, the angel says unto you, it was born this day in the city of David, a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Verse 12, here it is, this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. Boy, if that's, if that's not a sign, that's, that's pretty interesting. You find this baby that's just been born, and he's not in a house anywhere. He's not in a hospital anywhere. There's no doctors around. He's just in a barn. And so the angel tells the shepherds, there's the Savior which is, which is born unto you this day, and, and here's, here's where you're going to find him. He's not in the palace. He's not, he's not in, the, in the capital city. He's not, he's not surrounded by any people. When you find him, he's in a manger. He's, 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 he's with his, his, uh, 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 his mother and his adoptive father there. And they're trying to figure out how they're going to make it through the night with him. So when you see him, the sign is he's in a manger. Well, if you're a shepherd, <laughs> you understand what a manger is for. You understand this is, where, this is where the animals get fed. You put food in the feed trough and they stick their heads in there if, uh, sometimes. Or, or <laughs> well, they stick their heads in there. They'll just chew on the food a little bit. And so it's significant number two because of who Jesus Christ is. He is food for the masses. I mean, food for the people. He is, he says, I'm the bread of life. So it's significant, number one, there's no room for Jesus Christ. That's why he's in a manger. But number two, the manger tells the story of who Jesus Christ is. He's the bread of life. He feeds the creatures, so to speak. He feeds the animals. So he's in a manger, and so the, the shepherds are told, you're going to find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And to the shepherds, uh, uh, unmistakable. The, the type, the, the, the object lesson, the illustration is unmistakable. Here in this manger lies the bread of life. Here, here he is. Uh, Jesus Christ said, he said, I am the bread of life. He that shall come to me, or he that cometh to me shall never hunger. And he that believeth on me shall never thirst. What a, what a great story. That's why I say the manger just tells is the greatest story ever told, really. He's there because there's no room for him, unfortunately, which is the story of most of our lives. Secondly, he's there 
because of who he is. He is the bread of life. He's food. He is. Uh, uh, he provides nourishment. He says over there in Matthew, he said, "Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled." We again talked about that in Sunday school, but you get the idea. Someone who's hungry for righteousness, somebody who's thirsting for that, and Jesus Christ is the answer. He fills the soul. He satisfies that need. It's significant that the manger, number two, it's significant that the manger was where the, the flock was fed. Ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes. This is the sign unto you. And uh, boy, what a sign that would be. <laughs> what a sign. And then lastly is this. It's significant who's there. Verse 16, Luke chapter 2, verse 16 they came with haste. So the shepherds, they hear this news. They are overjoyed. They are overjoyed. They've been given good news by this angelic host. Angels singing, all that kind of stuff. And they, they head back to their the barns, whatever. Uh, the, the, they head back to where the manger is. And they find this couple. The Bible says, And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. Third thing is, it's significant who is in the manger. It's significant that the manger is where the flock is fed. It's significant why Jesus Christ is in the manger. But it's also significant who's in the manger. Jesus Christ is the creator of all things. And I, I, <laughs> I wouldn't know how to how to explain any of this other than mankind enters the world through birth. That's how you enter the world. And Jesus Christ becoming a man is going to have to enter the world through birth. So the creator of all things enters into this world through a birth. And that baby that is laying in the manger that is going to need his diaper changed... (laughs) <laughs> that is that it is going to be taught to walk and talk. That is going to, going to grow. And when he's 12 years old, the Bible says he's in the temple and he's asking questions and he's answering questions. He, he, he is the embodiment of God Almighty. And he's, he's in a feed trough, laying in a manger. And this is, this is the creator of all things. And try to, uh, uh, like Paul says, he says, Great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. I mean, he entered the world. He didn't enter the world by a spaceship. He just entered the world like every other man enters the world by a birth. And then he's laid in a manger And this baby in this manger happens to be the creator of all things. He created the earth. He created the stars. He created all things. And he grows up. He learns. You know, I guess the only thing you could say, you say, how in the world does he not ever sin? How does he not ever sin? You know how he doesn't sin? Because he doesn't have a human father. God is his father. So he doesn't have Adam's nature. He has God's nature. So when he's met with temptation in his body, he doesn't react the way Adam reacts. He reacts the way God would react in a body meeting temptation. So he lives 33 and a half years in a body of flesh. I say 33 and a half years. (laughs) He's still alive in that body. He didn't just live, he ministered on the earth, he was on the earth 33 and a half years, died, rose again, but in all that time, never sinned, every time he met temptation, he didn't treat that temptation like Adam, and Adam's heritage would treat temptation, he met that temptation with the way God would treat that temptation, in a body, how did he, how did he, he, 
address the temptation of hunger and thirst? And how did he address the temptation to be angry? How did he address the temptation to, to fight back? How did he address the temptation of being betrayed? How did he address the temptation of being bitter towards people who he loved, hating him? Well, he, he, he handled all those things because it's, he had the nature of God. He is the nature of God. He is the, the glory of God in a body. And so here's this baby, wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. Shepherds show up, and this baby is not any ordinary baby. This is the creator of all things in a little, tiny, little package in a manger. Incredible. It's incredible. It's significant who was in the manger. In in that manger was the humanity of God. It's it's one thing. I, 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 I don't know if you think it's different, but I think of it differently. It's, it's one thing to talk about the deity of Jesus Christ. To say, okay, this is uh, Jesus Christ is God manifest in the flesh. Okay, that's, that's, that's hard enough to understand. But in my mind, what's harder to understand is God and God's humanity. Maybe not the deity of Christ, if that makes any sense to you. Not the deity of Christ. But how about, how about the humanity of God? That's, that's, that's an interesting thing. The humanity of God. Here, here is God manifest in the flesh as a baby with a mom and dad who are going to tell him what to do. And he's going to listen. He, he, he'll do what they tell him. He's going to obey. He's going to learn. He's going to grow in, in, in rapport with men and socially. He's going to grow. He's going to grow in, in, his, in his wisdom and his knowledge as a human being, as, as, a, as a man, and he learns as he grows and all that stuff. The Bible says, interestingly enough, in Hebrews, it says, learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. As, as, as God as a man, God as a man doesn't need to know the concept of obedience. But what he learns is what obedience is feels like in flesh what does obedience feel like it feels like doing something you don't really want to do sometimes it feels like being told to do something and saying saying father it it, it, let this cup pass from me nevertheless not my will but thine be done it feels like i don't want to do this but i'm supposed to do this so the Bible says, learned he obedience. He didn't learn the concept of obedience. He just learned what obedience feels like in a body. If, if, as moms and dads, I just, I, if our kids, if our kids only do the things that we bribe them to do, they haven't learned obedience. They've learned a transaction. They've learned if I if I do this, I get a candy. If I do this, I, I get I get I get ice cream. They've they've learned a, a transaction. But until you learn how to do things you don't want to do, but you do them anyway, that's obedience. And that's God manifest in the flesh, Jesus Christ as a baby, growing up as a toddler. Not with Adam's nature, with God's nature, being told what to do, doing it, asking questions, learning, growing, all, the, all those kinds of things. It's significant. I mean, trying to wrap, wrap our minds around the fact that this baby is, is God in the flesh is just incredible. But this manger, it, it really, it's a great object lesson, and it really tells the story of Jesus Christ. Number one... It's significant why he's there. He, he's only in the manger because there's no room for him. And th- there's no room for him because somebody decided they're not going to make room for him. Maybe multiple people decided they're just not going to make room for him. I don't know if they were just, they're just ignorant of who he is. 
They're indifferent to, 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 to the situation. It's just too inconvenient to, to make room. You've got to kick out other guests, and I don't really want to do that. For all those reasons. But the point is, it comes to the, to the same bottom line, there's just no room for him. Second thing is, it's significant why Jesus is in the manger. Second thing is, it's significant what a manger is. It's, it's food, feed trough. And in that feed trough, here is the bread of life. That's a sign. That's the sign to the shepherds. You're, you're going to find this, this baby and he's in a feed trough. He's not in a hospital anywhere. He's not in, in the palace. He's in a barn. He's not just in a barn. He's in a manger where animals get fed. And Jesus Christ is the bread of life. And lastly, it's significant who's in the manger. In the manger is God manifest in the flesh. Here is... Here is Truth in a body. Here is wisdom in a little body. Here is, here is eternal life in a little body. Here is righteousness in a little body. All of these things are embodied in Jesus Christ. And all of those things are in the manger. He, he embodies everything that God is. In that manger was the humanity of God. So you say, what, what is the significance of the manger? I, I, ho- I hope you think of it a little bit different this year. When you see the manger and you see the whole manger scene, there's, there's a reason there's a manger scene. There's a reason th- these set of circumstances happened the way they did. There's a reason for that. There's significance to the manger itself being, a, being food for animals. Providing food for animals. And then it's significant that God was manifest in the flesh and wrapped in swaddling clothes and laid in a manger. Say, how, how in the world does that happen? I, I don't. I, I just know man enters the world through birth. And so when God entered the world, he entered the world through a birth. But this was no ordinary man. This was. This, This man had God as his father. This body, this body that was prepared by the Holy Ghost, had God as his father, had the nature of God Almighty. He was the embodiment of wisdom and righteousness and eternal life. And like like we said this morning in in Sunday school, you know, we, we think of these things as maybe ideas say righteousness is an idea or or eternal life is this this thing or the resurrection is this day like we talked about in Sunday school but you find out it's it's not an idea all these things are a person wisdom is a person righteousness is a person eternal life is a human being it's Jesus Christ all, all, all of that wrapped up in this little baby who will grow up, who will die on a cross and be resurrected and live, live forever. He was already alive before he was a baby, but now he just enters the world this way. But you get the idea. But I hope in this, maybe you can reflect and all reflect. and We can all reflect in the manger scene and the nativity scene. And now when you see one, maybe think about these things. Why this happened? Who's in there? What's the significance of it? And maybe it'll help you magnify Jesus Christ a little bit more in your minds and in your hearts, which is, I hope, I hope what you get out of this. Let's, let's do this. We'll just, we'll just wrap it up. I'll pray, and we, we'll just be dismissed this morning. Father, I pray this has been helpful. I pray that uh, we're going we're gonna to see enough nativity scenes from here to to Christmas but I pray that when we see him now we really think about think about what we're looking at and uh, think about who it is in that manger what the manger is and what it says about Jesus Christ and the person there and also why why is he even there just no room 
And hopefully we can make some more room for Jesus Christ. Um, I know we say Christmas is the birthday of Jesus Christ. It seems like maybe he's the only, only one with the birthday who doesn't get invited to his own birthday sometimes. And I pray that you would uh, help us identify areas of our lives where we can make more of Jesus Christ. And maybe, maybe we've got to flush out some guests that we've, we've made reservations for that uh, we need to make room for and maybe send them on their way and allow Jesus Christ to come in and occupy some space. Thank you for each soul that's here. Thank you for those that are watching. I pray that everybody gets a blessing out of this and is encouraged and uh, Jesus Christ is magnified. I thank you so much for salvation in Jesus Christ. Thank you so much for righteousness in Jesus Christ. And uh, Lord, if anybody's watching or hears this not saved, I pray today would be the day of their salvation. They would understand their need for Jesus Christ. The fact that God showed up in a body is, is proof that we all need and they need Jesus Christ. Otherwise, he just would have told us to do something and be saved, but there's nothing to do other than trust Jesus Christ. Thank you again for this opportunity this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You are dismissed.